Zeptepi, the first season for the gods who came from a sunken island. The following text will be a brief presentation of some not so well ancient mythological references, which require more extensive study by the reader, but also a serious approach from the beginning, as if they are approached irresponsibly without a minimal epistemological background, the scientific background. They allow some, quote, cunning to present theories that are, for the writer, at least funny, but very digestible and catchy, end quote. Now, one of the most enigmatic ancient references related to the flood and Atlantis are the Egyptian references in hieroglyphic writing concerning the era of Zeptepi. Spa means time and Tepi means first. The era, the era of Zeptepi therefore marks the first era for the first time for the ancient Egyptians. Existing reports come from three different sources, from hieroglyphic inscriptions of the Temple Edfu or Upper Egypt of Upper Egypt, the Ptolemy era around 250 BC, from the papyrus of Turin, priestly papyrus with the names of the pharaohs, which describe the time of Ramesses and the departure of the Jews around 1250 BC, but also the stone of Palermo, which dates to the fifth dynasty of the Old Kingdom around 2500 BC. Remember that uh, 2400 BC, I recently uploaded a video concerning the sky gods, quote unquote, that came from the sky and landed in China, Korea, and Japan. So this is about the same time here, 2500 BC. Now, the ancient Egyptians believed that the foundations of the, oh, by the way, the sky gods that came down looked human. The ones that came down in China, um, Korea, and Japan, 2400 BC, they were tall, beautiful, tender, knowledgeable, intelligent, gave them philosophy, sciences, and uh, writing, and uh, agriculture, and many other things. Now, uh, in Asia, now going back to this, the ancient Egyptians believed that the foundations of their civilization were established during this glorious time, uh, known as the Golden Age. R.T. Rundle Clark, professor of Egyptology at the University of Manchester, reports on the ancient peoples of this first age, and this is what he says. Everything whose existence or authority must be justified or explained must be mentioned in the first age. This was a reality for natural phenomena, rituals, royal emblems, temples, designs, magic or medical formulas, the hieroglyphic system, the calendar, all the supplies of civilizations, everything that was good or effective was founded in the beginning, this first age, which was therefore a golden age of absolute perfection, he said. It was a time when the wise gods came from an island that sank, bringing with them to their new country of Chem, or Egypt, a developed civilization. Let's remember that one of the Atlantean princesses, uh, as the uh, island was sinking, uh, escaped to um, uh, the uh, Algerians. The, uh, the Tuareg legend uh, called her an Egyptian princess. She was tall, very uh, beautiful, with uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, very intelligent, and they called her a goddess even though she was Atlantean, okay? Um, now, uh, so they brought with them their, to their new country, Egypt, a developed civilization. According to these records, there was a time when the gods and the demigods coexisted with humans, when the spirits of the nether, quote-unquote, took the form of humans. They had human bodies and animal heads, okay? Going on with this, it was a time long before the time of the moon, who was the first king of Egypt, the moon united the kingdoms of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, and founder of the first dynasty. These mythical ancient gods each ruled with humans for hundreds of years, yet under certain conditions they fell ill and died, so they were not immortal. These divine beings came from the primordial waters of non-existence, following the command of the reptile-headed god who remained nameless, in the texts of Edfu, E-D-F-U. 
This period lasted several thousand years until the works of the gods that coexisted with humans were forgotten. Archaeologists of the time of the gods, known as the first time or age of Zep Tepi, do not, of course, accept it as a real historical period because, on the one hand, it concerns a mythological reference, and on the other hand, because the time periods mentioned in the texts are unconventional in relation to the findings of archaeology. One of these ancient texts was the god Thoth, and you'll uh, have a playlist of the Emerald Tablets written by Thoth the Atlantean, who the Egyptians called a god. So one of the ancient gods was the god Thoth, who would later, or, or, or um, uh, Hermestris Megistus, who would later be named as Hermes the Triune, identified with the god Hermes of the Greeks. It's said that it was named, he was named Triune because he possessed three parts of cosmic wisdom, astrology, alchemy, and theology. The first reference to the god Thoth are made in the time of Ptolemy by the Egyptian high priest and historian of the 3rd century BC, Manetho, who wrote the history of Egypt in Greek. And according to the records accessed by Manetho, Thoth, or Hermes the Triune, lived in the time of the gods. According to Stoveus, Hermes the Triune had written 42 books on hieroglyphics, of which six relate to his medical knowledge, while the remaining 36 are of philosophical and cosmological content, Clement of Alexandria, one of the first fathers of the Christian Church, he said Saint Clement, states that the 42 holy books of Egypt were part of the books of Hermes. The Neoplatonic Iamblichus was uh, is based on the authority of the Egyptian priest Abamon and attributes 1,200 books to Mercury the Triune, Hermes the Triune, that is, Thoth. The Eugenius Laertes attributes an age of 48,863 years before the time of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great lived about 330 BC. To the books of Hermes and the sacred archives of the Egyptians. So that's about, what, 50, 51,000 years ago. So God Thoth master of wisdom, all of the sciences of alchemy magic. He was also the founder of the occult mysteries, invented and taught hieroglyphic writing to the Egyptians. Many of the scriptures are attributed to him, including the Bible of the Breaths, a portion of the Bible of the Dead, the Emerald Tablets, and the Symbal, C-Y-M-B-A-L. Thoth also appears as a high priest of the mythical Atlantis and the founder of the first colony of the lost continent in Egypt, which he ruled for centuries, exceeding in time the lifespan of the people. Just remember, the Atlanteans were very, uh, had a very long longevity. He then placed his records in the Great Pyramid regarding the chronology of, chronology of this era, apart from the well-known references from Plato to Timaeus, which are part of what the Egyptian priest is said to have said to Solon. Herodotus mentions the dynasties of these ancient gods. Quote, when the scribe Hecatius, born around 549 BC, was in Thebes of Egypt, present-day Karnak, the priests of Zeus, after hearing this, his attempt to connect his origin with the god 16 generations ago, did exactly what they did to me, although, unlike Hecatius, I avoided personal genealogy. They took me to the big mansion and counted the wooden statues that are there. The number was exactly what I said since every high priest puts a statue to be erected there before he dies. As they showed them to me, counting them at the same time, they started from the statue of the high priest who had recently died and continued in turn after assuring me that each of them was the son of his predecessor. When Hecatius analyzed his family tree to conclude that his ancestor 16 generations ago was a god, the priests refused to believe him and insisted that there was no mortal of divine origin. They refuted his claim by referring to the genealogy of their own high priests and stressed that each of the statues represented a, quote, Pirumi, end quote, who was the son of another Pirumi, until they listed the 345 statues that did not make the slightest effort to connect them with some god or hero. These, then, were the creatures that the statues represented. They were not gods, but people. Porimis, the Greek, means handsome and brave. 
However, before their time, Egypt was actually ruled by gods who lived on earth among humans, and each time one of them had power. Their last was Horus, son of Osiris. Horus is Apollo for the Greeks. So it was Horus, the last god who sat on the throne of Egypt, the one who defeated Typhoon. Osiris is called Dionysus in Greek. So, of course, Dionysus and Apollo are both ancient Greek gods. Now, the 345 statues of the high priests are equal to 10,350 years. If we calculate based on the 30 years of each, he took over at 30 and handed over to his son at 60. Herodotus himself estimated 11,340 years for the 341 generations. Also of particular interest was the Hebrew called Book of Enoch, not including the books of the Old Testament. Enoch is considered to be the seventh after the Jewish patriarch Adam to live before the flood. As mentioned above, the duration of the kingdom of the gods exceeded in time the normal duration of human life. Correspondingly, the life expectancy of the Jewish ancestors far exceeds the human life years. Of course, it is known how much Jewish mythology and not only has been influenced by Egyptian mythology. So the correlation is probably not accidental. More specifically, Enos was the son of Seth, the grandson of Adam, and the father of Canaan. According to the Bible, Enos lived 905 years, Genesis 5. Enos believed in God, worshipped him, and always invoked his name. Enos had sons and daughters, and at the age of 90, he acquired Canaan. Canaan was the son of Enos and the father of Malaleel, according to the Bible. Cain lived to be 910 years old, Genesis 5, 9-14. Canaan had sons and daughters, and at the age of 70, he acquired Malaleel. Malaleel, or Malaleel, was the son of Canaan and the father of Jared. According to the Bible, Malaliel lived for 960 years. Malaliel had sons and daughters, and at the age of 65, he acquired Jared. Jared was the son of Malaliel and the father of Enoch. According to the Bible, Jared lived 962 years. Jared had sons and daughters, and at the age of 162, he acquired Enoch. Enoch was the son of Jared and the father of Methuselah, whom he acquired at the age of 65. According to the Bible, Enoch lived 365 years, Genesis 5, 18-24. Enoch had sons and daughters, and at the age of 65, he acquired Methuselah. Enoch was a model of faith in God. The end of his earthly life was also unique, since he did not die like all mortals, but was transferred, as the Bible says, Genesis 5, 24, Hebrews 11, 5. That is, he was taken to heaven by God because he had pleased the God. Methuselah was the son of Enoch and the grandfather of Noah. According to the Bible, at the age of 187, he gave birth to Lamech, after whose birth he lived another 782 years. He had sons and daughters, Genesis 5, 21 to 27. He died at the age of 969, a year before the flood. He is the oldest in the history of mankind, Methuselah. Lamech was the son of Methuselah, at the age of 182, gave birth to Noah, for whom he said that he will receive, he will relieve us of our labors, of the labors of our hands, and of the land which the Lord has cursed. And according to the Bible, Lamech lived 555 years after the birth of Noah and had sons and daughters, and he lived a total of 777 years. In the book of Enoch, among many other, uh, among other very interesting things, there is a reference to angels who, quote, and it came to pass that when the sons of man were grown, in those days beautiful and graceful daughters were born, and the angels, the children of heaven, saw them and longed for them and said that among themselves, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves from among the children of men, and let us bring forth unto them their own children. End quote. And Samiezas, who was their leader, said to them, I am afraid that you will not agree to do this thing, and I alone will pay the penalty for a great sin. And they all answered him, saying, Let us all swear by the oath, and let us all swear by one another, that we may not forsake this plan, but do that which we have decided. Then they all swore together and committed themselves to mutual curses. And there were a total of two hundred in the days of Jared, came down to the top of the Mount Hermon, called it Hermes, Hermon Hermes, because they swore and cursed one another on it, and these are the names of their leaders. 
Some as he is your leader, Arathak, Kimbra, Samani, Daniel, Arieros, Shamiel, Iomeliel, Hokariel, Ezekiel, Vatriel, Sathiel, Atriel, Tamiel, Barakiel, Anantha, Thoniel, Ramiel, Asahel, Rael. These are their dozen leaders, chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. And all the rest took women with them for themselves, and every one of them chose one, and began to enter into them, and to defile themselves with them, and to teach them charms and medicines and rhizomes, and to teach them to know herb the herbs. And they captured and gave birth to great giants, 3,000 feet tall, who devoured the toils of men, and they began to sin against the birds and the animals and the reptiles and the fish, and to eat one another's flesh, and to drink the blood. And the earth blamed the lawless, chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. And Hazael taught the people how to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, all kinds of precious stones and old dyes. And there was much disrespect, and they committed fornication, and were deceived and corrupted by their teachings. Samazias taught them charms and rhizomes. Armaras taught them the solution of charms. Rachel taught astrology. Holiel the signs of the earth. Sathiel, the constellations, Sariel, the course of the moon. The following is a detailed account of the arts taught to women by the angels and the evil that the giants sowed on the earth until the four most powerful angels, Michael, Gabriel, Suriel, and Uriel, looked at the earth and realized what it had happened and when they informed God. God decided to throw the fallen into the depths of the Babbits forever the giants to be destroyed by their own hands, and the sinful race of men to disappear from the flood. One cannot help but find here the similarities in the battle of the Titans and Prometheus. Is there anything else that would support Plato's chronology of Atlantis, but also the moments that these ancient gods are supposed to have left behind? Many researchers and proponents of forbidden archaeology believe that the great pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx of Egypt can reveal much to one of one de deals with the heavens and the stars, temples and shrines were associated with astronomy and the position of the stars as they were a reflection of heaven on earth. It seems that everything points to the fact that everything is interconnected on a global geodetic network, the equinoxes and the solstices, which in antiquity coincided with different astronomical positions from today, also played an important role. Delphi, for example, was the crossroads of the zodiac between the equinoxes and the solstices. But what happened with architecture has its correspondence in the human body. Respectively, the vertical axis north-south symbolizes the trunk, the trunk and the upper body, while the horizontal east-west corresponds to the diaphragm. The winter solstice is identified with the north, the summer with the south, the spring equinox with the east and the autumn equinox with the west. Thus, the vertical axis is the solstices and the horizontal is the equinoxes. The descent of the souls in the field of matter is symbolized by the summer solstice in Cancer because from that day onward, light begins to diminish and darkness to conquer more and more of the 24 hours. Thus, respectively, the souls leave the maximum light and enter the body and the material light that slowly makes them forget their divine origin the opposite process occurs in the winter solstice when from the maximum night we get gradually passed to the ever-increasing light. This return or coming of light in antiquity is identified with the Mithraic mysteries, while in the Christian world when the coming of Christ, whose coming to earth as the light of the world is placed on December 25th, that is very close to the winter solstice. But let us return to Egypt. For thousands of years, the great sphinx, this unusual monument in Egypt has its eyes fixed on the east and it gaze, its gaze on the sky, reading to the stars a message forgotten for centuries by mankind. There is a very convincing evidence, if not evidence, that the three pyramids of Giza west of the Sphinx are in fact an accurate map of the three stars of the Orion Belt. The three pyramids have been constructed as an earth depiction of the three constellations of Orion as they appear in the sky 10,450 BC. The Sphinx, that's about uh, 12,500 years ago. The Sphinx is an equatorial pointer that faces the sun's rise when it rises from the sign of Leo. When did this happen? It happened between 10,300 
to 8140 BC, it was the time of Leo, the sign of creation. Little is known about this time. Astrologically, this was the golden age, quote unquote, as Leo rules gold, it was then that the sun was worshipped as the primordial god of light and life. The Sphinx is a lion monument, Leo, the age of Leo, with a lion body and as they say with a lion head originally, according to researchers, the Sphinx was built during the spring equinox of the year 10,500 BC. At that time the sun at the vernal equinox of that year was 12 degrees below the horizon with the sign of Leo already beginning to rise. The earthly lion sphinx was identical to the constellation of Leo. The researchers also observed that as soon as the sun begins to illuminate the sky, if one turns south at an angle of 90 degrees from the point where the sphinx faces east, one will see that at the meridian of the meridian are the three stars of Orion's belt. The formation and distances of these stars are identical to the formation and distances of the three pyramids of Giza. How random can all this be? And why was the Leo era that began with these astronomical phenomena called the first time or the golden age? Zeptepi. In Greek mythology, Hesiod speaks of the golden age. People then lived like gods, he said. They did not suffer and did not know hardship or old age, but they were always young men. They rejoiced in festive banquets. They were not afflicted with diseases and their death seems like a sweet sleep. After the golden race, the silver race was created by the gods. They were a literally unhappy generation. The cause of misery was ignorance and the refusal to offer honors to the gods. Next was the Bronze Age. It was a genus, an age uh, that used copper. It had bronze houses and weapons. They were a kind of warlike people. It disappeared due to the war conflicts and followed the fourth genus, a genus of heroes, a genus of justice and bravery which, however, was exterminated in wars. The most unhappy era was the Iron Age. This is the era in which the poets lived. Uh, the poet lived, he describes it in black. The genus, the age, will be destroyed due to the moral deprivation of the people. There will be no honor for anyone who keeps his word, neither the righteous nor the good, but they will honor the evil and the wicked more. The only law will be power, while the consciousness of true justice will be lacking. Eidos and Nemesis, respect and law, will fly to Olympus. They will leave the earth. Moral deprivation and perver perversion will even bring about biological anomalies. Children will be born with white hair and will not look like their parents. These teratogenesis will also mark the end of the Iron Age. Perhaps it's also no coincidence that the uh, god Akar, or Akar, one of the earliest gods in the Egyptian mythological pantheon, worshipped as the personification of the horizon, was represented as two lions gazing in diametrically opposite directions, with the disk of the sun between them yesterday and today. This is how they are depicted in the chest on the chest of the Sphinx. And because of this depiction, Akar received the accompanying Ruth, which means two lions, guardians of the entrance and exit of the underworld. In this capacity, Akar is the oldest guardian and the dead turn to him to open the gates of the underworld. The custom of placing lion-shaped figurines or statues on the gates of palaces, tombs, and houses to this day comes from that same iconography. In closing, I would like to point out that there are many mythological elements that seek answers, and the indications of which contradict the findings of the archaeological dig. In any case, time will tell whether the history of the planet and of human civilization is what science today accepts or exists if the ancients had well-hidden secrets which may one day be revealed. And this I've translated for you from a Greek article by Ledzos Vasilis. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. I kindly support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.